Amen. Good morning, church. We are so glad that you are joining with us here this morning. I have fantastic news to share with you all. Connie Boyles will be on her way home today. She, her surgery went very well. She was in recovery, and uh, the, her and her and Hobby, her son, are uh, on their way home. If you're unaware, uh, Connie was in desperate need of a kidney, and her son Hobby was able to donate a kidney to her. So. Uh, they thank you all for their prayers, and I'm sure uh, if, if, if they can be here next Sunday, they're planning on being here. So uh, it's God is the power of God and the power of prayer is awesome. Amen. Our friend Job once, once wrote, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you please stand with us as we begin our worship time this morning? Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Father God, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give to us in life. Father, I pray that as we go about this service, that it'll all be for your glory. Father, we do thank you and uh, for the power of your Son, the Holy Spirit, um, as we have been praying for the Boyle family uh, this past week, and we are so thankful for their good recovery that they are that they are having, Father. Father, I continue to pray a special blessing upon this service, and again, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love. The dead of night and you tell me 
time this morning, would you please stand with us as we all join in singing Waymaker. Miracle worker, promise 
his keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are oh you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart i worship stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working and even when I don't see it you're working and even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working and even when I don't see it you're working and even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are oh you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are, 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 oh, that is who you are, that is Wasn't that great? Praise team, thank you very much. Good morning. I have been uh, working on an old farmhouse since I retired. And I got home and I hurt bad. And it reminded me of the time I ripped my bicep out. So this morning, I'm going to be getting my scripture from John 14, 26 and 27. 
I'm going to call this, Can We Relax? I entered the physician therapist's office knowing I would I'd experience a lot of pain. The therapist stretched and bent my arm and held in positions I hadn't been in months since my injury. After holding each uncomfortable position for a few seconds, she gently told me, okay, you can relax. I think I heard that at least 50 times every therapy less session. Okay, you can relax. Thinking of these words, I realized they could apply in the rest of my life as well. I could relax in God's goodness and faithfulness instead of worrying. As Jesus neared his death, he knew his disciples would need to learn this. They'd soon face a time of upheaval and persecution. To encourage them, Jesus said to he would send the Holy Spirit to live with them and remind them what he had taught and so he could say, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. There's plenty we could be uptight about in our everyday lives, but we can grow in our trust in God by remembering, reminding ourselves that His Spirit lives in us, and He offers us His peace. As we draw on His strength, we can hear Him in the therapist's voice's words say, okay, you can relax. If we come this time this morning to remember our Savior that did come to that cross and die for us and come back, as we uh, partake in our cup and this loaf, if I can get mine open, we take the bread. Dear Jesus Christ, I just thank you so much for going to that cross and giving us this bread to represent your broken body. I just thank you so much for this juice that represents your blood, and I just know that you are with us always. In Jesus Christ's name, I ask it all. Amen. So last Sunday as I strolled up here, the guy running the microphone back there told me Forrest Gump was at church talking about my haircut. All I can tell you is he doesn't have any hair. Do you, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm glad you're here today. And uh, as we come together, as has already been mentioned, that is great news about uh, Connie getting to come home. And we'll be doing whatever we can for them as we have need. And I know there's others in our church that have need as well. And uh, this morning in our evangelism class, we talked about how important that is. And that's an extension of our home, this home, this corporate home, and our individual homes to reach out to those who are in need in our family. And there, there's a lot of, of that needs to happen. And I know it will, because we care about each other, and that's the mission that we have been given. 
as we shared last week about the simplicity of the message of the gospel. I shared this morning earlier about how devastating it was to me as a teacher to not have church anymore a year ago in March. And how so strange those months were. And now here we are 15, 16 months later and basically lost a third of our congregation uh, to what used to come here regularly and meet together. And it, it's, it's still hard. We're still fighting things that we never thought we would have to experience. And it's easy to get out of practice, and I use that word scripturally this morning as we talked about practicing our hospitality. It's easy to get out of practice in our Christian walk about the things that we know that are important. And you remember if you were fortunate enough to get to go to church camp or and or VBS, and we used to sing songs about being close to the fire. It only takes a spark to get the fire going. Do you remember that song? Yeah. It hadn't been that long since we sang those songs. And then what happens when you get away from the fire? Yeah, you get cold. A lot of things happen when you get away from the fire. You lose the excitement of the fire. How many of you like having fires? You know I do. I was going to have one this afternoon, but drops of starvation are landing. So, no fire this afternoon, probably. Just for fun, I got some stuff needs burnt. In our Christian walk, <clears throat> we went away from the fire. We got away from each other in a, the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me in my Christian life, and I hopefully you too. I hope we never experience that again. I, I would much rather suffer a lot of different things than to say we aren't going to be together as a church family. There was an old man in the Bible. He was probably 40. I'm just guessing how old he was. He might have been 50. There was this young man that I'm going to guess was in his 20s. And this old man wrote the young man three letters in the New Testament. As Paul writes to Timothy. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy. And I want you to listen to these words of this older man. Because they hit me right between the eyes. And I pray that through these words, as we talk about the simplicity of the gospel and how easy the gospel message is. And we shared that last week. And it's just a... It's just simple. But it is work. And it is something we need to stay after. As Paul writes to this guy, he reminds him of legacy. Some legacies are really good and some legacies are really bad. For instance, right before church started, Mark and Jeremy were talking about the Cardinals and the Cubs. Now, there's some legacy there. Some's really bad. Some's really good. And you can choose whichever side of that you wish to be on. I'm not going to take sides. I'm with both of you. No, I'm kidding. Where, where am I in the legacy of Jesus Christ? Where are you? I, I want you to just stop and think about your life. Who shared with you the gospel message to the point that it convicted you to take Jesus as your Lord and Savior? That was more than likely one person. Now, there may have been a corporate effort as we all live together. 
VBS is a corporate effort that's going to happen here this week. Revival is a corporate effort. I remember used to be days of revival when people would give their lives to Christ and were baptized. That was very common. We can't even get Christians to come to revivals now, so we pretty much gave up on doing revivals. I don't see the point. It's good to sit in here and get fat and fed by someone, and I love that. But what good does it do to the kingdom? What's my legacy in Jesus Christ? Who shared with me the gospel? And then here's the good one. Here's the hard one. Who have I shared Jesus with? And how am I still sharing this morning Jesus with? I don't know what was going on with Timothy. Paul says he left him crying. He said, I remember your tears. Something was happening with the young man. Let's pick us up. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 5. I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and then your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And, as this, and for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I think Timothy has come to a spot in his life as we read this where he is either depressed or that he has just been rejected in his ministry and nothing's working right and he's ready to give up. And so maybe he's just quit. Doesn't say that. But Paul is writing to him and says, hey, you remember the legacy that you have in your life? Do you, do you remember where you've come from? Do you remember whose you are? He goes, do, do you remember Grandma? Do you remember all those things Mom used to do for you? And you remember how the faith that they had has now been brought to you? He said, I want you to rekindle that. The fire has went out. He got away from the fire. And he needs a jump start. Are you, are you with me this morning on needing jump started again in your Christian life? To get this work that we have been given going the way God needs it to go. And it starts with me and it starts with you. It starts with me saying, what am I going to do this week to share Jesus with somebody somehow? Doesn't mean I'm going to be standing out here on the corner. You know the guy that used to be on the megaphone after church up on the corner? I loved him. But I don't know that he ever reached a single person. You guys remember him? A couple years ago, he used to be up there when we'd leave church. He'd be up there by the stoplight with a little blowhorn, bugling gospel. <laughs> I don't know if anybody ever stopped, but buddy, he was trying. I don't know that we need to do that. But I know. I pass a lot of houses of people I know that live there that aren't in church this morning. that need to know Jesus. It's not people I don't know, it's people I know. How about you? I need to rekindle the fire. I need to get back up next to it. I need to get heated up and warmed up for the cause of Christ. Paul starts off by pulling his emotional chain. Emotions are good sometimes when he reminds this young man about his family and about where he came from. All of us didn't come from that. Some of us came to Jesus as an adult. Some of us never had that experience to get to share as a child. You were fortunate if you did. Whatever the case, wherever and however we came, we need to get next to the fire. Timothy was in a down place in his life. And Paul's encouraging him. Let's go on and listen to what he says to him here. Just a few more verses. 
verse 7. We're going to read down to verse 11, I think. Yeah, let's read down to verse 11. Starting in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted to us in Christ Jesus for all eternity, from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death, brought life, and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. And we can put our name right there, and our name would say, and a neighbor, or a brother, or a sister, and just fill in the blank of where you are in life and where I am in life. I was appointed, you were too, if you've taken on the name of Jesus, to do something for the cause of Christ. But I love verse 10, because it is the gospel all over again. He brought immortality, the message of life eternal. And if there isn't a better time than to share that with this world, I don't know where, when would be a better time. When all they want to do as the secular world, and you're going to, it's turned into a religion of trying to heal this planet. It'll never be. It'll never happen. They don't understand what happened in the Garden of Eden. They don't understand the separation. They don't understand when Jesus said, if I don't do what I do, the rocks and the hills are going to cry out for worshiping God. You remember that? We have, there is no choice. This planet is already history. But the great news is there's immortality and a brand new one coming that's going to be perfect. A brand new planet. A brand new earth. And it's big. And it's the way this one was supposed to be. And I can't wait. We already have friends and family there waiting to get to go there. They're not there yet, as according to what Scripture teaches. Don't know exactly how all that works, but I know we're in the hands of God waiting for that day. When the new Jerusalem comes down, that huge city that's 1,500 miles square, Denver, Washington, Orlando, Chicago, 1,500 miles and 1,500 miles high. Huge city. Besides the rest of the world, as we get descriptions of out of the book of Isaiah and Revelation. The, this message of immortality and the new world that's coming should be exciting, not only for us as Christians because we understand the truth of God's Word, but for a world who doesn't, don't know anything about this. And there's a lot of folks out there who don't know anything about it where they've come from, where this place came from, and where we are headed. It is the greatest opportunity that I think we've had as a church movement worldwide in a long time. Now, you've got to get past that there's some kind of Mother Earth scenario where the Earth is a God of its own or an end-all of its own. This earth is going to burn. This earth's going to burn. We know that. My house that I live in is going to burn. Yours is too. Everything that we think is important to us here on earth, except for those who will get to go with us when we leave, it's going to burn, including those who don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. What a time to rekindle the fire of the gospel message of Jesus Christ and share it with people about the great news of the future. 
Jesus was hidden. He brings us the power to overcome death and immortality and live in perfection. I don't know what perfection is for you. I know what it would look like for me. It'd be fun to talk about that, wouldn't it? Because we all have different ideas on what perfection in this life would be. I know one thing for sure. There will be no need for healing. Won't that just be something huge? Man, that's great. There will be no need for AC. Because when the AC breaks now, I'm in big trouble. Because I hate it. I am spoiled rotten. There won't be any need for a lot of things that we have become so accustomed to living in this endangered world that we live in. Paul mentioned something else to this young man. Back up there a little before we stopped there. He said he brought us discipline. See, none of the good things that are going to happen in the future will come to our life unless we are disciplined people. And that's what the world doesn't want to hear. You know, the, the thought of, of defeating death and the thought of immortality and living in a perfect world and having a perfect world, that sounds great to a lot of folks. Until you mention the fact that you have to live a disciplined life. That you need to live a life according to the gospel message. We have become way too accustomed to sin. Amen. We have become way too accustomed to things that God calls abominations. We have become way too accustomed to being cowards. Yeah, me. Rick read a verse out of John chapter 14. Don't be afraid. Paul writes to this young man, Be bold with the message I gave you. I don't want to read this, and I'm not going to read this. But I want you to go over to Revelation chapter 21 when you get home and read verse 8. Because it talks about me there. It talks about anyone who's a coward about the gospel. But turn with me over to the Hebrew writer. And let's see what the Hebrew writer says about discipline. And you guys are familiar with this, but I just want to remind us. As Paul tells this young man, and he tells us, discipline has got to be a part of our life. Meaning two things. We need military type discipline when it comes to the way we live with our morals. Morality is huge. And it is something we have lost. And it's unfortunate that there's so much of that and it's so prevalent. The necessity to be morally disciplined in our life. And second discipline is the discipline we get, not only from our God, but even from our church, which... We don't do much, and I pray we don't have to. Now, when Hob gets home, I'm sure there's going to be some discipline required from him. Because I know how he behaves, and I know he misbehaved at the hospital, I just guarantee you. But discipline from our God is real. And as I shared a little bit last week about the kid who goes to the refrigerator and keeps getting the soda because nothing happens, there's no discipline. He was told not to do it, but he still did it. 
So he just keeps doing it, nothing's happening. Nobody's stopping him. But our God's seeing it all. And he knows it all. And he disciplines us even when we don't think that he is. You guys know these verses, but we're going to read them. Let's just read one. Hebrews 12, verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. No kidding. Did anybody ever like running laps when you didn't do well on the basketball team? We had to run lines. I hated lines. Still hate lines. Don't want to see lines. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I don't think our basketball coach gained one thing by making us run lines when we lost. I don't know where that theory came from. It wasn't making us any better. We were losers. <laughs> you aren't going to change a bunch of losers into winners just by running. Now, I wish that would have been the case. But that didn't happen. But God takes losers like us and he disciplines us in ways that makes us all into winners. Amen? Every single one of us win. There are no losers in God's house. None. Not a single one. If they listen to the discipline that God has handed out, he is going to say to every single one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Not you guys are losers, you're running lines again tonight. Only in God's world, that's not what happens. The losers are never going to get to even see the perfect kingdom, the perfect world, the new Jerusalem, because they've already been sent to their destiny. Because they didn't listen to the discipline that comes here from the Holy Spirit now, nagging them to know about their creator and creation to know about judgment and the things to come, and to know about righteousness and how righteousness indwells within us. After we have been trained by discipline, it yields peace. Rick, thank you. Peace. Peace. We all win. Another old man's about to die in Scripture, so we're going to read a little bit from him and we'll go home. He writes us two letters, just like Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. Peter writes two letters to the church. Peter calls himself an elder all the time. He is an apostle. Jesus makes him the rock in which he's going to build his church. And Peter never can accept that responsibility very well. He always feels unworthy. And when you read his writings, he writes to us as a brother or an uncle or a father. He never writes to us as, I'm the supreme leader of the church. No, he never does that. He writes to us in such a way, and he says, I'm about to die. Please, there's some things that need to be done in your life. Please, make your God happy. And in his second letter, he really gets down to the brass tacks, if you will, if you like some old language about how important it is to be found in peace when Jesus comes. To be found clean when Jesus comes. And to become and to, to be spotless 
And they're all important things. But in his first letter, turn there with me. Peter's first letter to the church. In the second chapter, he talks about the necessity and the, the reasoning to, be, to keep our fire kindled and to keep our discipline working and to know that it is God who cares about us deeply and He knows that there will be losers of life who are not going to get to go with Jesus when He comes because they didn't listen to the gospel, they did not obey Christ's law, and they let immorality and other sin rule in their life to the point they lost their position in Jesus. And Peter's begging us, pleading with us in chapter 2, the first 10 verses, not to let that happen. And he reminds us, he says, therefore putting aside, this is 1 Peter chapter 2, first 10 verses, therefore putting aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. I have some bitterness in my life I need to get rid of. It's hard. I don't think I have any hypocrisy. What you see is what you get. I'm not perfect, neither are you, Jeremy. Do I have any guile? Do I have any envy? See these things, people see. And they know we're not real. And he said, remember how a new kid acts, a young kid who's innocent, a brand new baby? That's you, that's me. He goes, act like that. Act like that. You know what a new baby does? It smiles and anybody will smile at them. Usually, right? And they'll start smiling whether you smile or they look at it. Don't you wish you know what they're thinking? Man, you're the ugliest guy I've ever seen. I don't know what they're thinking. You feed me. That's the next one. Where's the food? Did you bring any? I, you know, and so as we grow as kids, we have all that innocence. Peter said, get back to that and let people see it. You've tasted how good Jesus is because Jesus, listen, Jesus looks at us through those exact eyes. That's how we need to look at others. He looked right by all my failures. I love that song. Don't you? It comes out of Psalms. He looked right past all those things and he loved me. And that's what kids do. That's what we should do. That's what the world needs. That's what they need to see. Peter says, put it in your life. Act like that. He goes on and shares some great things. Verse 4. And coming to him as a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. No losers in God's eyes, ever, if we're obedient to the truth. Always precious, always winners, always worthy. Don't let the world beat you up. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood and, and to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, and he starts quoting a lot of Old Testament prophecy about Jesus. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. 
This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected became the very cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. Peter reminds us about how important the obedience is to keep our life clean and spotless and pure. And for those who don't, there is doom coming. It's not preached. It's not taught. And so when those words are shared in the world, they take the Bible and they say it's irrelevant. They say that it is politically incorrect. They also say that what was written in Scripture is no longer truth. And that, folks is where the power of the Holy Spirit to convict people of the church is what we need to pray for. When Jesus was asked about the Holy Spirit and He's sharing that with His disciples, you remember what He said? When the Spirit comes, He is going to convict the world of sin. If there's folks in your life that you love dearly, or maybe you just like them a little, the need to know Jesus, and they won't come to the truth, and they won't live according to the gospel message, pray for the Spirit to convict them. John chapter 16, verse 8 and following. How important is our prayers? They are extremely important, and God wants to hear it. The Spirit needs encouragement, like we need encouragement. You don't think He gets tired? I don't know. But I know God says, pray fervently for those you love. And we pray for the power of the Spirit to convict them of sin that will separate them and they will be bound forever to this doom that our friend Peter is writing us about. Let's finish this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, <clears throat> a people for God. God's own possession that you may proclaim the ecclesies. <laughs> you guys say that for me. There you go who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There was a time there was no mercy in my life and yours either, because I was outside of the family of God. I didn't even understand the family of God. It took me 20 years of being in the family of God to even kind of get an idea what it meant. Now I know. And Peter says, we're in. We are the chosen people. We have been adopted. He doesn't say that here, but we know we are adopted into the chosen race. The royal priesthood us. The people who used to be losers are now winners. And not only are we winners, but we're in the priesthood. All the way back full circle to Paul talking to young man Timothy. What have we been given to do in life? I know. You've been given the same things I've been given. To look at people through Jesus' eyes and love them and have compassion on them thinking about the day of judgment 
Are they ready to meet Jesus? And what can I do to help them get ready? If they reject Jesus, they reject Him, and I'll pray for the Spirit to convict. But there's people that are going to accept Him through the words we share, through the actions we do, and through the lives we've lived. Let the discipline of God be yours, and let it train you, let it train me, that it will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The praise team is going to come and we're going to sing about the Bible. And it's an opportunity for all of us just to reflect. And it may be an opportunity for you to accept the great gospel if you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. It may be an opportunity for you to say, I want to be a part of this great nation. And just a little piece of it meets here at Marion and you want to join this family that meets here. Or you may just need prayer and you want the elders to lay hands on you and pray for something. They don't even have to know. They would be glad to do that. See, the family of God is about the gospel. And seeing the world through Jesus' eyes become babes. And we have one goal. You get to go to Jesus, to that new earth. Let's stand and sing. If you've got a decision to make, we ask you to come. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope in this world. prayer list. VBS this week. If you don't have a particular part in VBS and you just want to come and be supportive, just come and be supportive. There will be something to do. Yeah. Otherwise, you can do whatever. Heather, the outfits are out here in this hallway, aren't they? Um, if you haven't already, uh, please right after church, go out there and pick you out an outfit. Um, if you are a fellow, you probably will pick out a tunic. And if you're a woman, you will pick out a dress. 
But the problem is they all look the same, so you make that pick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if you would please, they're all out there, so um, make sure you pick one out before you leave today, please. Father, once again, we just thank you for the blessings of being able to be here in fellowship together. And as BBS was mentioned, dear Lord, I pray as we continue uh, in this new week that you have blessed us with uh, the call that's been upon our lives uh, to be a witness for Christ. And we have that opportunity this week, dear Heavenly Father, with a lot of young lives. Father, I pray that you would empower us with so many things, with wisdom, with strength, with perseverance, with patience. Dear Heavenly Father, as we share with these young lives, Father, as always, as we are able to, to be with these children, we pray that what is shared might go further than just this week in-house, that the love of Christ and the things we have to share and even our own attention that we give to these children, Father, might uh, seep into the homes of the caregivers and the parents. And the love of Christ might be seen and felt there. Father, we pray that... Um, as Heather shared with us when we had our meeting, that even if we don't get one family as a result of our endeavors, that what was shared with these children, dear Heavenly Father, uh, might cling to their hearts. And somewhere along uh, their young lives, dear Lord, they'll remember what they learned and they'll receive Jesus. So Father, I pray as we leave this place now that we won't drop the ball, but just like Timothy, we'll remember our faith and our foundation, where it came from, that we might be the foundation for the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Good afternoon.